I got really good at wearing a mask. And if you wear that mask for a long enough time, you lose your own identity somewhere along the way. I remember those days of getting up and saying, just get me to the point where I can lay back down and go to sleep. It just consumed me. It was there from the moment I got up in the morning to the moment I passed out at night. I had always had some glimmer of hope, but there was a point where that was gone. You don't understand in a situation like this what possible good could come from such a horrendous thing, but God can do anything. There is hope, and even when you don't feel like there is a way, God has a way to the other side. Hey, what's up, everybody? You guys excited to jump into our new message series today? You guys are weak. Come on. You excited to jump in? There we go. That's better. That's better, man. I've been so pumped to hang out with you guys this morning. We have a new message series called The Bridge, and it is in preparation for Easter. How many of you know Easter's just a few weeks away? And it really is a contemplative time in the season. For some of you, you grew up celebrating a season called Lent. Uh, Lent is really a time of the year that precedes Easter, where we prepare our hearts, we reflect over how what happened 2,000 years ago is true today. And what I recognize for me is too many of us have been living on the wrong side of victory for too long. Too many of us have been on the wrong side of the bridge for too long. And in this life, we all have bridges to cross. We all have decisions to make. And what I found is in this Easter story, we are confronted with decision after decision. And how many of you know that you are the sum total of your life decisions? You really are. The choices you make today are going to define your tomorrow. And too many of us are sitting in this place in the bridge. We're like, Pastor, I've been in a valley way too long in my life. I've been in a season of difficulty and hardship. But i got to tell you, if I was to be honest, some of us sit there because we refuse to go to the other side. Because, man, I've been so used to this dysfunction. I've been so used to this arguing with my spouse, to having conflict with my parents. Like, man, I'm so used to the trauma I've been living in. But going across the bridge, it's scary. I don't really know what's on the other side. I know that the Word tells me, man, if I go there, Jesus is going to carry me. What life has brought me to, God is going to bring me through. But you know what? I don't know if He's going to carry me on that bridge. Why? Because we look down, right? What are bridges for? Bridges connect one side to the other. It gets us from one side of our story to the other side of our story. Some of you have been asking for a testimony. God, I want to experience you in a fresh new way. God, I want to experience you in a way, see you in a way I never have. But some of us are like, but I don't have a story. I don't have a testimony like him or her or the pastor. But really, their testimony came because they were willing to cross. So many of us just played safe on this side. And as long as we stay on this side of the fence, we never experience the full redemptive plan of Jesus. How many of you know you can know Christ here? You can be saved here, but you're never going to live in a victory unless you cross there. But we stay here. And then we live disempowered lives. We're frustrated, we're angry, and we're blaming everybody. We even blame God. We even point the finger at God and, and wonder how come a good God hasn't rescued me from this position I'm in. I'm sorry, guys. Did I come out swinging today? My bad. I'm going to slow down. If you're joining us on podcast in person or online, welcome. We're going to have a great service for you guys today. I'm sorry. I just came in excited. But if you guys return to me, Mark 14, man, we're going to open up our context today in this Easter story. Now the, uh, so it's Mark 14, verse 1. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people might riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. Let's just stop there. I didn't plan on preaching this today, but this just stuck out to me right now for you guys this morning. He was there with Simon the leper. I don't know about you. Maybe you grew up in a home where you were like the black sheep of your family. You were the person, maybe you were the least favorite amongst the children. Who feels like they were loved second best? Don't put your hand up. I'm joking. You know what? Jesus is attracted to the leper, which means he's attracted to you and I. Because you know what? Every human being, we have spiritual leprosy. Every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have transgressed. We've sinned. And you know what? There's this view in society today, right? Like, there's good people. Guys, ain't nobody good. 
Now there's a spectrum, right? There's more good and there's more bad and all of us are somewhere in that pendulum swing. But the only one who's good is Jesus. The only way we're made good is with Christ. And you know what? Scripture shows us that Jesus is attracted to hurting broken people. Jesus is attracted to the people that everyone else rejects. Jesus is all about you today. And a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, which means they were shocked, they were frustrated, they were angry. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. You see, let me stop there. Oh man, sometimes things pop out to you. This woman was serving God. This woman did what didn't make sense. And how many of you know when you're called of God, even well-intending Christians will criticize you? Why? Because they don't know what God spoke into your life. They don't know what God called you to. They don't know what God is stirring. And they don't know what you're giving up. This woman gave all she had to Christ. And they criticized her because she was all in. And you know what? They criticized her because her all in didn't look like you're all in. Or you're all in. And we project, don't we? Like God is going to work in your life the way he works in my life. Guys, that ain't true. God's the same. But you ain't the same as this person. And we're so quick to judge, aren't we? We're so quick. And you know what? This woman didn't let it get to her. So many of us were called to ministry. We're called to leadership. And you know what? If you're a follower of Jesus, let me break the news to you a little bit. Ministry is not a pastor in a church, guys. It is every follower of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is in every believer. No matter how old you are, young you are, or whatnot, you are a minister of the gospel. Why? Because you are a vessel that carries the good news. And you know what? Don't ever allow people to discourage you. Because sometimes we step out in faith in our awkwardness. And guys, we're, we're afraid, right? I mean, that's, that's just across the board. We all struggle with fears and anxieties. And then one person criticizes you and what we, we pick up our bags and we go home. Like, I, they were right. I knew that. But this woman didn't let, let it get to her. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. You see, when you step out in faith, when you, when you get away from your comfort zone here and you go across the bridge, spiritual fruit is going to happen on that side. And you know what? That you will bring with you for all eternity. That's going to be celebrated with you in heaven. But you know what? No, I want the house. I want the dog, the picket fences. I want that career. I want that advancement. None of that is bad here. The problem is what's bad is your heart's attachment to it. You're, you're, you're settling for a counterfeit God, a counterfeit pleasure and joy. This makes me happy and safe here. Why? Because I can control it. But God, what he wants, man, that is scary. Am, am I going to have enough to pay my bills if I'm chasing after Jesus? Will he provide? But you know what? We get so caught up in love with the gifts rather than the giver of the gifts. You know what? What you do on the other side of the bridge will be remembered forever. Stories will be told about you like this woman. But, but verse 10, then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. He lost heart. And that brings us to bridge number one in Judas' life. Man, I... I walked with Jesus. Jesus called me after he taught on the Beatitudes. And I, and I saw his teaching and a fire burned in my heart. And I started to follow this guy, put my foot on that bridge. And I saw him heal the sick. The lepers were healed. The blind were able to see. The deaf were able to hear. And I walked and I followed him. But how many of you know he always had an end game, right? Scripture actually tells us he helped himself to the money. So he actually never made it all the way, but he kind of stood here and he watched Jesus from the outside. And then one day Jesus did something he didn't understand. You see, this whole time I've been following Jesus. He's helping people. He's giving to people. And right now Jesus did something that doesn't make sense to me. I had an expectation of how Jesus ought to respond and he failed me. Wait a minute. You mean there's times in my life where I'm going to pray and God's not going to answer? You mean there's transitions I'm facing and God's going to be silent? Like, man, that's not what the pastor told me. The pastor told me pray, believe, mountains will be moved. I have power. And when I pray, God is silent, so I'm going to stay right here and I'm going to get angry. Because how many of you know that your faith is challenged when God doesn't give you what you want? You see, and for the first time that we can see in Scripture, 
Jesus did something that did not make sense to Judas. And for so many of us, that's where our faith goes to die. Let's understand that. You got your cancer diagnosis, your spouse walked out on you. Whatever your challenge or difficulty is, man, I was hurt as a kid and God didn't protect me. That wasn't good what I experienced. It doesn't make sense from what I've been taught, what I read in Scripture. So you know what? I'm never going to the other side. And that's where your faith goes to die. But how many of you know even Jesus' most desperate prayer wasn't answered? Jesus is on His knees in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be Your will, take this cup from me. And you know what? God was silent. God was silent, but Jesus didn't camp out here. He went across to the other side and He says, I know Your goodness and and Your mercies endure forever. Let not my will be done, but Yours. And because of that obedience, the redemption of your souls was purchased. The freedom from sin and death, victory on the cross, why you guys are Christians today, was achieved here on this side of the bridge. And so many of us, we hang out on this side of the bridge. We hang out at this side of the bridge so long. We're so frustrated. We're so angry. And some of us live perpetually offended by God. And our hearts, and you guys got to watch your heart. Let me talk to you a little bit about the heart. Your heart strays, folks. It strays when we don't get what we want. When things don't make sense to us, it strays. And, and you guys are, are going to know what I'm talking about. You ever been in a relationship with somebody and you guys are doing life together? They're like your best friend. You're reading the Bible together. You're encouraging each other. They're there for you. And then all of a sudden, they take extra long to respond to your text messages. And all of a sudden, they stop liking the things you, fa- you, you post on Facebook. Right? Facebook, right? And if you're younger, it's Instagram. And if you're younger, it's TikTok, right? And all of a sudden, their behavior changes. Now, you don't know what's going on. But what you do know is that there's a change in behavior. So you reach out. And you know what? They don't address the elephant in the room. You try to talk to them. You see, something shifted in their heart. The heart shifted toward you. And then eventually, the relationship is broken. And they cut you off. Why? Proverbs 18.29, one of my favorite verses. A brother's who gets offended, when his heart turns, it's more difficult to retain that heart, to regain that heart, than it is to take a fortified city. This is actually what it says. A brother offended is harder to win over than a fortified city. You could actually be in battle against a city, and it's easier to win that than when somebody's heart strays. So if you're in your marriage, and you're struggling in your marriage, don't let your heart stray from your spouse. Don't talk that junk behind their back or in your head because you're feeding something that will end in death. Don't say that about your church. Don't say that about your pastors, your leaders, your brother and sister sitting next to you in the chair. But see, that's where Judas went wrong. That was his first bridge. Jesus did something that didn't make sense and my heart started to turn. But in that moment, I could have done what Jesus did. I could have crossed the bridge and reminded myself of God's resume in my life. God, you've rescued me before. I've seen you heal the sick and give sight to the blind. You've done it for all of these. Why would you fail me now? But he didn't do that. What he did was he allowed his heart to shift, turn from his Beloved Jesus, and that led to death of a relationship. So i got to tell you, when we're in a place of distraction, a place of confusion here, it's either where your faith goes to die, and you stay there, or where your faith grows. You're either going to go, or you're going to grow, folks. You're either going to push through it, or you're going to be plowed over by your negativity, by the thing you struggle with. You see, it's not God's will that you and I camp out here. You might be in a valley, And i got to tell you, valleys are actually good, folks. You see, God doesn't define what's good based on how it makes you feel. Let me say that again. God doesn't define what's good by how it makes you feel. What's good is what suits His purpose. It's what suits His purpose. That's what's good. Or how He can redeem something. You see, so, so, so what are you saying? You mean, if I'm praying for my loved ones to come to know Jesus, they might have to hit rock bottom? They might have to get a diagnosis. They might have to lose their job so that they can be humbled and broken and they can look up to heaven and say, God, I can't do this anymore in my own strength. I need hope, Jesus. And somehow life can come through death. You mean goodness might be something I fear? Goodness might be something that hurts? Something that might even take my life? Man, i, I got to tell you, I've, my mom, it's a great story. My sister, I'm going to talk about you. Is that cool? I'm going to say something good, I promise. The week you weren't here, I promise you I'll blow up your spot. But anyway, my mom was on, was on her deathbed a couple years ago. 
And my sister at that time, was she was really struggling in her faith. Uh, she wasn't really going to church. She wasn't really anchored deep into the things of God. But God used the most terrible day of her life and, and my own and, and others in our family to harvest her soul, to bring her back to God hardcore. Not only did she come to church, but, it came, but we have to look at the origin of it. It came through something terrible that suited God's purpose, and yet it was good. Now, what if God would have taken my mother's life? She would have still been here, and it still would have been good. But it would have hurt like hell. But it would have been good. Because God doesn't define goodness on how it makes you and I feel. It's whether it suits His purpose. Guys, you got to get up. Say get up. Say walk. I got to walk and I got to get my butt to the other side. You, you got to move because if you don't, this is where you're going to spend your life here on earth. You might be saved, but you'll never know the goodness of God because you're living in a hell. But see, it's that moment for Judas, his problem, that moment, it was his perspective. So many of us live life with the wrong perspectives. How many of you know what you believe about God, what you believe about what his word says has all the power to make the difference in your life? It's either going to bless you or if you believe wrong things, your beliefs are going to curse you. You see, your beliefs about God are exposed by how you handle those moments when you feel far from God. I'll say that again because that's every time we're over here. Your beliefs about God are exposed the way you handle those moments when you feel far from God. When do I feel far from God? When my prayers go unanswered. When He's silent. When a diagnosis has come. When a hardship has come. When I can't figure out how to pay my bills. When something tragic happens in my home and I am rocked to the core. And folks, you live long enough, you're going to experience a lot of these seasons in life because they come and go. It's the ebb and flows of life. But how many of you know Jesus is the bridge? Jesus is the bridge of your hope. He's the bridge of your salvation. But it is not God's will that He would just save you for eternity. It is also His will that you would cross this bridge and get to the other side where you will experience goodness, peace, joy, happiness, contentment, joy in the Lord. It's, it's on that side that Jesus desires to push you. Why? Because He has a purpose and a goodness for your life. Every follower of Jesus is a minister and you are never going to become all that you are meant and created to be playing it safe here. Playing it safe here in our dysfunction. 1 John 2.23 says this, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son also has the Father. Let's talk about that for a moment. Do you ever wonder how Jesus in His sovereignty, God, right? Like He knew Judas was going to turn His back, and yet He still chose Him. See, some of us feel like that today. There's some of us who are so riddled with guilt and shame. Some of us grew up in church. Some of us, our parents came to Christ when we were 10, 11 years old. And man, some of us as adults, right, you still struggle we still struggle as adults sometimes, and yet God still chooses you. But you see, I can't look myself in the mirror. Some of us are so compelled by guilt and shame that I can't look God in the eye anymore. I can't look myself in the eye anymore, and yet God still chooses you. Why? Scripture tells us that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who you've been with, God still chooses you. He's got His 99, and He's willing to leave all of them to come and find you. And come and find you. He doesn't leave you out. Your family may have turned their back on you. People in life may have stabbed you in the back, but Jesus is coming after you. Why? Because, hold on to this word, it's relentless. Say the word relentless. It's God's desire that you experience His relentless love. His all-consuming, relentless love. But it comes through a fresh perspective shift. And that inspires our message title today, Fresh Perspective. You're never going to get from here over there unless your perspective changes. For much of my life, I, probably 20 years, I had a horrible perspective. So I grew up in the city, uh, immigrant parents who worked really hard and they worked for everything they had. They actually came over to this country kind of as indentured servants. I kid you not, someone paid for my whole family, a generation or two to come over. They came over with 15 cents in their pocket and they had to work construction jobs, endless hours and get paid peanuts just to pay back whoever paid for them to come. And they were indebted for years. And you know what they were? Multiple jobs. Not only did they pay the person back who basically it's indentured servanthood, right? I got to pay you back before I'm freed. But they also started secondary jobs and they would work on the weekends and they would save this money for their future and this money would go to pay back their debt. And that stuck with them for the generation. So here's a generational belief. Life is not going to give you anything. Guys, don't walk away with these. I'm telling you what I heard, okay? Life is not going to give you anything. Life is hard. It's going to chew you up and spit you out. 
You have to make your own way. You have to carry your own back. Everybody in your life will turn their back on you. No one is going to help you. You are on your own. Man, there was no acknowledgement of God. There was no acknowledgement of the church. Man, what they said was with good intentions. So what did I walk away with as a kid? I grew up in the Bronx. Let's throw on top of that. Don't trust anybody. Don't make eye contact on the train because crazy eyes is going to look back at you. How many commuters do I have in here? You know crazy eyes, right? God forbid you're, you're a girl you look up and some weirdo dude is looking at you. It's like, whoa. And he comes to sit next to you and your husband gets angry at home. I got your back, Joe. No, seriously. So I, I grew up with this belief, right? That um, it was in my own strength. That I had to make it happen. I had to push through. Uh, that I needed to be driven. I mean, on, the, on the outside, it seems like good things, right? But nobody has your back. I got to make my own way in this world. And you know what I projected, right? That's, that's projection. Projection works like, like this projector screen, right? There's a picture inside and it projects it on the wall. My early life beliefs and values that were instilled in me, I projected on the world. And I believed that I needed to be loyal to everybody and nobody would ever be loyal to me. I believed I had to help everybody, but nobody would ever help me. So what did I do? I never asked for help. Never. I never asked anyone to meet a need of mine. I never shared with anybody when I was struggling and I would put on the fake church face. You guys know that face, right? How are you doing today? You had the worst week of your life. And I'm like, praise God, I'm in church. God is good. And you're like, you are a liar. You've been struggling all week. I saw your Facebook, your Instagram. I saw you talking about, you know, Susie. So, you know, I grew up with that and I projected it. And really all as I was doing is the wounds of a generation ago with some life experiences, taught me some really bad things. And, and I robbed myself. I robbed myself of relationships. I robbed myself of the love of the church of Jesus. Then I became a follower of Jesus. I was saved, but I was still a hot mess living right here. And I still believed all those things. How many of you know, right, there's that saying, God is in my heart, but grandpa, my family, the things they taught me, they're in my bones. So I, I lived as a son of God here, but I lived a life of lies. And so many of us, we're here today, and all of us project folks. Let me just expose your heart a little bit and allow the Holy Spirit to do its work. There's internal projection. Maybe in life you grew up and you've had some hard experiences, and in those moments you thought, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm incapable enough. Maybe someone spoke that about you. If you're not number one in your class, you're just first place loser, kid. Maybe you heard that. Maybe you experienced those put-downs. An internal projection is we grab that voice, that experience, and we make it true about ourselves today. And how that manifests is through anxiety, folks. And you know what? I'm scared to make phone calls. Honey, can you do it? Some of us, I don't know where I want to go out to eat. You ever been in a relationship with that person? You're like, where you want to go out to eat? And they're like, I don't know. There's too many options. I'm getting stressed out. I'll just go. We lack confidence. It robs you. Or you get so stressed with life, all of a sudden you get paralyzed, and you're like, I can't function. I'm just going to sit on the couch and I'm going to do nothing. And what ends up happening is we sabotage our lives. Why? Because there's internal projection. And then there's external projection. External projection is we grab what we have experienced on the inside and we put it on other people. And you know what? My Uncle Joe, I actually have an Uncle Joe, so I'm not going to talk about you if you listen. I'm sorry. Um, Uncle Jerry. I don't have an Uncle Jerry. Uncle Jerry, I didn't like him. He made me uncomfortable. Uncle Jerry was intrusive. He had no boundaries. And then I meet this guy, and he reminds me of Uncle Jerry. So you're a jerk. I don't like you. Poor guy didn't do anything. That's projection. Well, I'm married, right? Maybe my wife says or does something. And this, I'm going to share with you guys a real issue. There's many times I share something. I'm all excited about it. Now my wife is all more admin-minded, right? And what I want, what I expect, it's for her to say, man, that's awesome. I love it. What a great idea. That is from the mouth of God, and you heard it in your ears. Amen. Do you do that? Zero. She's like, I think you, what about that detail? What about that thing? Man, I don't think you thought this out. And I'm like, you are so critical. You don't support me. And she's like, stop it. She's like, you know I'm for you. This is a, this is a real conversation. I could you know, you guys are laughing. This is my pain, okay? <laughs> like, she's like, you know I'm for you. I always stand for you. I'm never against you. I believe there's God, and then I believe in you second. Like, 
And you know what? And all of a sudden she brings me back to reality. And I realized in that moment, I saw her as somebody she's not. I projected on her my own inadequacies, my own pain, my own wounds. That person who did say those things, it ain't my wife. But in that moment, I make it about her. And we do that with God, don't we? We, we project on God. And you, bro, you grew up in a family where you had an absent father, an abandoning father, right? Maybe he's just physically not there, not just emotionally absent. Maybe you've been hurt. And we believe that about God here. Maybe you grew up in a home that was penalizing. Everything you do is wrong. And you, instead of experiencing the love of God, you experience the hard, the hard correction of God. It's projection. And you see, that's where this dude Judas was. Wrong beliefs will either bless you or cost you everything. Guys, we have to heal. And the way to heal is one step at a time. One step at a time. Knowing that what's below here, I might be on an old rickety bridge, right? But what's below there can't touch me. Why? Because I'm with God. I'm literally with God. He is above me. He's behind me. He's upholding me. Scripture says, I am in the palm of His hand and nothing can take me out. Those water, those currents, the hardship of your situation won't touch you because if God is for you, who can be against you? But, but here's the cost. Here's the cost of these projections and camping out here where you're not meant to stay long. Proverbs 26, 27, I love this. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. If someone rolls a stone, it will roll back over them. If you dig a pit here and stay here, you're going to fall into it and you ain't getting out. Your projections, your hurts, your wounds, your misbeliefs, you approach God the way Judas did. When God doesn't measure up, I dig in. When God doesn't give me what I want, I dig in. When God does something out of I, how I understand His character to be, I dig in. Guys, when you dig in, you're in the pit. You ain't ever getting out of that pit until you have an encounter with Jesus, a radical return back to truth. He is good, even when life is not. When I don't understand it, I know He has a plan. All things work together for good for those who love God. And I'm a lover of God, but I'm hurting today. But I know I'm in an upward trend. I'm in an upward walk because Jesus is carrying me through. It's God's will and His desire that you cross. But here's some practical things. You guys can open up your app. All my notes are there. But these are real things that I use to, to help me walk so that I don't anchor into this pit or get rolled over by that stone. I pray for insight regularly. And this is what it sounds like. It's repetitive. God, help me to see what I don't see in my own life. Help me to see that, God. Two, there's a few people in my life, my wife included and some of you in here, that I go to and I say, because you're trusted, do you see something in me that I'm blind to or I'm unwilling to look at? It's accountability. This one you guys will will feel the sting of a little bit. Repetitive themes in your life. You see, repetitive themes, I think this way often. This thing comes up a lot in my life. This is a sticking point in my marriage. It's a sticking point in my relationship with my parents. It's a sticking point of why I can't do well academically. Like, there's a repetitive theme in my life. I'm chronically feeling bad about who I am. Whatever that repetitive thing is, that repetitive thing means you and I need to get over that bridge because you're camping out right here. Repetitive themes will always expose a bridge you need to cross. And you've got to understand something about crossing bridges. It's never easy, but that's where your testimony is made. So then when I discover it, I educate myself. What does the Word say about this? The only source of truth that doesn't change. What does it say? I journal. Self-insight and awareness. You'd be surprised what comes out in journaling. Whenever I see a lie exposed by the Spirit, I correct it with biblical truth. What's that verse that's going to speak to this and, and put me on the right path, right? Scripture says don't look to the right, don't look to the left, but keep your eyes focused. You see, when I walk over this bridge, guys, I'm not looking at the bridge. I'm looking at the person on the other side of the bridge. When Israel walked through the, through the sea and it was split, could you imagine if they looked at the walls on the sides of them or turned around and saw the army coming? All as I know is I see Moses' is back and I'm walking. And Moses is like, all as I see is that, that, that pillar of fire in the sky or that cloud or that cloud. And I'm walking, I'm keeping my eyes on this. And I'm not looking here because if I do, I'm going to falter. When, when Peter was walking on water, when did he sink? It's when he took his eyes off of Christ. You got to walk. Maybe some of you need to seek counsel or you need to you need to pray that God gives you the strength you don't have to make the changes that only God can make in your life. And that brings us to bridge number two that Judas experienced in his life. Bridge number two was, man, you know what? My heart shifted, and rather than pulling it back, I anchored in, and now I sold Jesus out. Guys, 
None of us want to identify with Judas. Whenever we say, which Bible character are you most like? What are the people we come up with? I'm like Moses. I'm like David. I'm like this person. Ain't nobody said I'm like Judas. But you know that's the truth. Every one of us have had Judas moments, but you don't have to live a Judas life. Hold on to that. Every one of us have sold Jesus out. When do we sell Jesus out? Every time we choose sin over obedience. Every time we choose negative thinking over truth. Every time we anchor into lies. We choose here instead of there. Every time I choose conflict with my spouse over peace in my relationship, I choose here instead of there. We all have Judas moments, but you and I don't have to live a Judas life. And when we think about Judas, I think what messes it up, rather than being honest and saying, we are all kind of like Judas at times, but we don't have to live like Judas, rather than being honest about that, we're like, he's the worst person in the world. I heard somebody say that once, right? I'm like, well, who's Judas to you? He's the worst person in the world. He sold out my Jesus. I'm like, really? Like, we've sold them out so many times. And then somebody else is like, but doesn't the word Judas mean praise or to be praised? And the other person's like, no, it means liar. It means thief. It means someone who stabs you in the back. It's, it's a betrayer. Matter of fact, we all believe such bad things about Judas and we try to put such a gap between him and us that not one of you, when you thought about baby names, was like, oh, let's call him baby Judas. Come here, baby Judas. Not one of you did that. Why? Because it's a name that's cursed. It's a name that's cursed. Guys, but Judas wasn't meant to stay there. And that brings us to bridge number three. You see, God loved Judas so much. And we often don't look at even this part of the story. We like to say, well, the the devil entered him. And that's true. It's in Scripture. Scripture actually shows us that the enemy entered him. But God still didn't give up on him. You see, no matter what you've done in life, no matter how far you've strayed, God hasn't given up on you. You may be walking into service today and you may not even know what you believe about God. Maybe you're an atheist. Maybe you're an agnostic. That's cool. We all got good questions. But the reality is God ain't given up on you yet. As long as there's breath in your lungs, there's hope for you. There's hope for me. And bridge number three is the power of conviction. Do you know the Holy Spirit convicted Judas? You know what conviction is? It's not to make you feel bad. It's not so you can live in guilt and shame perpetually for the rest of your life. That's what the enemy of your soul wants for you because it keeps you from living an empowered life of Christ, the life of Jesus. But conviction, the first ministry of the Holy Spirit, we just did a great series on the Holy Spirit. Go back and listen to our our past series and you're going to learn one of the most important ministries of the Holy Spirit was the ministry of conviction, where he exposes you and convinces you that you're a sinner in need of salvation, in need of a redeemer. And conviction means I'm convinced that I'm in need of help, and it moves us to the cross through conviction. And at the foot of the cross, I lay down my burdens, he bears all my sins, pays my price, and then his righteousness, his goodness, his mercy, his love is now bestowed upon me. It's a trade, it's a barter. Jesus, I'm going to give you my junk, and you're going to give me a reward. So that's where he's at. Matthew 27, 3-5. This is what it says about this moment of conviction for Judas. When Judas, who had, been, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Then he said, I have sinned. It almost sounds like repentance. For I have betrayed innocent blood. And then the chief priest said to him, What is that to us, they replied. That is your responsibility. You see, that's what the devil would have you believe. But it's your responsibility. That what you've done is unredeemable. The thing you've done has separated you from God. You aren't good enough. You're never going to measure up. That's not my responsibility. That's yours. Guys, that's not the Word of God. That's not the promises of God. God says, you screwed up. It's my responsibility. You got a debt. I'm going to pick up the tab. I'm going to set you free. You may have put yourself in a pit, but I'm building a bridge in front of you, but you've got to cross it. But you've got to cross it. But that's not what Judas did. Judas hit despair because, you see, the greatest barrier to Judas was his beliefs about Jesus. This is what it says. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And I can see this moment, tears in his eyes, the the weight of sin and death on him. There is no hope. Guys, I don't wear that weight of sin and death. You know why? Because it's forgiven. Jesus literally took it off of me. I am free. Judas wasn't though. He he believed that he was beyond the salvation, beyond the hand of God. Jesus was up on that cross and I am beyond the payment of sin. He threw it in despair. Scripture says, then he went away and hung himself. You may have a Judas moment 
But you do not have to have a Judas perspective. You don't. And you know what? We see this because the apostles, the rest of the 12, they all turned their back on Jesus. When He was hung on that cross, how many of them went and said, yo, that's my Jesus. I'm going to take Him down. What are you doing? He's an innocent guy. None of them. They scattered. They were afraid. Even Peter, the most common story we know, he turned his back on Jesus. He denied Him three times before the the rooster crowed twice. But you know what's really awesome about that story? It's his beliefs about Jesus that brought about healing in his life. You see, I'm here. I've sinned. I've screwed up. I've made mistakes. Jesus is my bridge. And my beliefs about Jesus is that he's good. That his love endures forever in spite of what I've done. Matter of fact, I've seen Jesus heal. I've seen him raise the dead. Surely he can raise the dead in me. My spirit is dead. My heart is dead. I've screwed up. I've fallen short of the glory of God. But no weapons formed against me shall prosper. Why? Because of Jesus. My sins are forgiven. Why? Not because of what I've done, but because of Jesus. And it's upon those promises that I take my first step. It's upon the promises of God that He is for me. He will never be against me. I'll take my next step. It is upon the promise that when I was, that I saw and experienced when I was walking on water and I started to sink, even in the midst of my absence of faith, a hand came down. It felt like from heaven, but really it was Jesus on the water and He pulled me up. Upon that, I pulled myself forward. And on the other side, I experienced my hope, my joy, my peace. It is in God and the promises of God. That's what it means. That's how you get up out of your faith. Don't allow your beliefs about Jesus to be the barrier of the next bridge that's in front of you. Every one of you has a bridge. Every one of you has a bridge that you face in your life. And as we start to wrap up this message, I'm reminded Romans 8, 21, uh, 8 verse 1 to 2. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And what really hit me hard as I was wrestling with this message over the last couple of weeks. I've been praying about this for weeks, actually. And I didn't really know. It didn't all come together until midweek. Psalm 119 stuck out to me. And I saw that David, he pressed his way through the storms of life, through the hardships, the pits, the big boulders, the giants that were in front of him. He praised his way through it, and he prayed his way through it. And he reminded himself of the goodness of God. But how many of you know sometimes in life you need a pep talk? That's why it's really important that you make wise decisions of who you surround yourself with. Who speaks into your life will define your future. You need to understand that at every age. Don't sit there right now and nod your head and be like, yo, you heard that, kid? Like, you're an adult. The people you hang out with and listen to at work, they're influencing you. They're leaders in your life. It's irrelevant of your age. Guys, it's all of us. And and you know what? The greatest pep talk that David experienced was from God. He experienced a pep talk. And he reminded himself of the promises of God. And here here goes uh, uh, Psalm 119, verse 111. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. God, I focus my head and my mind on the truth of your word and not the experience I'm in. How many of you know that it's when you're here, you have to rest your heart on the truth of God's word and not what your eyes see. You see, what I give myself over to is the perspective I have. Every one of us has a perspective in life. There's a thing that we call to be, that we claim to be true. And when we hold that, we actually surrender ourselves to it. And it will define us. And what we have to do as believers is recognize that I walk by faith. I don't walk the way the world walks. And you know what? I don't, I don't base my future on what my eyes see. I base my future on what his word said. And in verse 112 says this, I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever. Too many of us sitting here have stayed in a declined attitude for so long, for so long in our lives. You're in the pit, you're in the valley for a really long time, but you're not meant to stay here. You've been living a declined life. Some of you have recliners in your house and you know what it means to recline. Gravity pulls you back, but you've got to get up you got to push against the resistance. you got to incline your heart. you got to incline your spirit. you got to get up out of your comfort zone. And you got to walk. you got to take a step of faith. you got to, you got to choose to trust God for the promises He has for your life. you got to stop living a declined attitude, a woe is me attitude. Some of us, we're pessimists today. You know why we're pessimists? Because we're scared people. I'm just scared of being let down. I'm just scared that that promise is going to fail. I'm scared about the way things are going to turn out. So you know what? I'm just going to have a negative attitude, sabotage everything, and then when bad things happen, I'm like, oh, I saw that coming. No, you know what you do? You rob yourself of the good moments. Life is a mixed bag. Life is incredibly beautiful, but it's incredibly painful. And you know what? Perspective. Perspective is everything. You've got to be willing to incline yourself. Stop living, church, a declined attitude. 
and incline yourself to the truth of God, to the statutes of God. It's the only way you're going to walk in faith. Walking in faith is a decision that depends on you, not God. God puts the bridge in front of you, but you have to say, I'm willing to walk, and then the Holy Spirit, because you can't do it in your own strength, right? The Holy Spirit gets you across that bridge when it's hard. It's by faith. It's not by sight. It's by the truth of God, not what my eyes see. And then he says this, verse 113, I hate double-minded, but I love your law. You see, on this side of the, the bridge, I'm double-minded. I'm struggling with guilt. I'm struggling with shame. I'm confused about how I feel about things. I have decisions ahead of me in life. And you know what? I have inner dissonance, conflict. But you know what? Truth is truth. Truth doesn't need a salesman to sell you something. You know what? When I'm here, truth might be hard to accept. Sometimes it's hard to deal with, but it's secure. It's firm. It doesn't change. And the psalmist is teaching us, you need to remove the double-mindedness in your life. You need to remove the barriers that hold you back from crossing the bridge. You are my hiding place and my shield, my hope. I hope in your word. Depart from me, evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of God. I'm going to remove the wrong people from my life that keep me here. The wrong distractions from my life. The things that ensnare me when no one else is looking. I'm removing them so that I can walk forward in faith. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live and let me not be put to shame in my hope. See, guys, your calling, your future, it's often contained in your greatest challenges. Sometimes the thing you're attacked most in is the thing you are meant to be most productive with. I'm going to say that again. Your calling is often contained in your challenges. Sometimes the thing you are attacked most in is the thing you are meant to be most productive with. Not only is it God's will, guys, that you cross, but I know some Christians that have lived here too long, and they're like, I believe in God. I had that moment, but I, but I don't have that testimony. We talked a little bit about this earlier. I don't have the testimony that you talk about or they have. You know where testimonies are built? It's built right here. Some of us don't have testimonies because we've never chose to walk. We've never chosen to get up out of the things that hurt us and snare us and walk to the other side. You see, your testimony is built when you walk in faith. If you want a testimony, if you want to experience God in a fresh new way, guys, we got to get over the bridge. And the truth is you can't do it in your own strength. For some of us, it starts with a relationship with Jesus. For others, you've been following Jesus for a long time, but you're still living here. And you need the power of the Holy Spirit to get you there. Guys, it's time to cross a bridge. Say cross a bridge. Say it's time. If it's time right now for you, you need to surrender your will, your desires, your volition. You need to be like Jesus and not like Judas. Lord, let your will be done. Let me get through this life. If that's you and you want that and you want that power that we talk about, that Holy Spirit power to get there, to walk over the sea of your difficulty, the currents of your problems, it's going to take a radical return to Jesus, guys. And I want to give you that opportunity right now. If you believe that, if you want that, would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, for your mercy endures forever. Lord God, your scripture makes salvation so easy. Lord God, that all we have to do is believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for our sins and He paid our sin debt. Lord Jesus, I pray that You would give us courage, faith, power to get across the bridges that each of us face in our lives, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we wait in You even when it doesn't make sense. Lord God, even when You're silent, we wait on You for Your Word promises, God, that our strength will be renewed your name, Christ Jesus, we pray. Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come, uh, come and enjoy service with us. And if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com, and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.